All right, hope everyone is having a blast. Wonderful thing about Circle City Con, all wibbly wobbly, lots of things messing up, but uh, hopefully we've fixed it up on the front end so you don't have to see too much. So, lots of things to talk about, but uh, terribly sorry I've been injured, uh, so my future self may end up regenerating into someone, maybe a little bit more gray-headed, less fezzy, less bow tie. So, we'll see how that goes. But I think I already have a good name for him. Um, something coming to my head right now. What is it? It's a phrase I keep hearing all the time. Uh, a wolf, a bad, a bad wolf. <laughs> wolf Gorlick, everyone. Thank you, sir. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for staying. Jeez. Circle City Con. This talk is on designing systems. I'm going to put my drink down here before I drop it. Now I see why they always put the whiskey down there. All right, designing systems. My name is Wolf Gorlick. I am with Duo. And now my slide clicker works and the life is good. All right, so I'm with Duo. I am the advisory CISO out there. Uh, what that means is I spend a lot of time thinking about CISOs, what works, what is excellent, what's fantastic, what doesn't work. And I'm going to bring some of this talk to you today and talk about some of the ways that we can design and implement security systems, controls, everything else we're doing, build products, make our people happy, save the world, and do it all in the next 50 minutes. Cool? We all good? All right. And this is also a very heavily Doctor Who themed talk. Doctor Who fans? Not all of you raised your hands, though, and you're probably thinking, oh my god, I'm not going to get this talk. It's okay. It's okay. I know football. I don't. But I do because I've had so many cybersecurity talks that are like, this is football. And Andrew Hay always does his football analogies. So now it's really great. I, I, the sales guy's there, and he's like, bro, did you see the game? And the other guy's like, yeah, man, they're right down in the end zone. And because of talks like this, I can walk, I'm like, hello, fellow sports fans. <laughs> The end zone is where strategy matters. Like, yeah, and where teamwork comes together. Yeah, and where you need good run books for instant response. So I, I, I promise you guys who did not raise your hands, you will at least be able to converse with the Whovians at that level of proficiency. That's my commitment to you. Where this talk starts is where all good adventures with the doctor starts, right? The new companion walks in, and what's the first thing they say? You guys left me hanging the other day at slide... Uh, whose slide is in with, so don't let me hang in today. What's the first thing people say when they walk in? It's bigger on the inside. Smaller on the outside. <laughs> Why is this important? The number one thing that we need to remember is we're killing ourselves in cybersecurity because everything is out of scope. As CISOs, <laughs> thank you, that was a little bit of delay, appreciate that. As CISOs, how many times do you say, oh, that's out of scope, we can't talk about that. We've got great controls for our instant response life cycle and great controls for our people. They come in, they get on board, there's joiners, there's leavers, there's movers. It's all secure. I'm like, that's fantastic. How many of your employees go through that process? Like every single one. I'm like, that's great. How big is your workforce? 100,000. How many employees? 40,000? Well, wait, wait, what? Yeah, there's contingent workers, but they're out of scope. <laughs> okay. I was doing an assessment. I was helping an organization get ready. And this was like week five or week six. And, uh, and I was like, all right, so tell me about your asset management processes and what you do for IT. And the guy's like, and he turns to the CISO and he goes, wait, that just works for our data center. Should I tell him about Azure and AWS? And I went, wait, what? And she goes, no, leave. <laughs> he had to do the walk of shame to his cube, people. He's like, I talked about something that was out of scope. We're killing ourselves. Because so much of what happens is bigger on the inside, right? So much of the IT that we need to protect is so much bigger than what we're doing. And that's some of the reasons why we need to start thinking about this as kind of a design problem, an artist problem, a problem of people. Um, and we know with cloud that's usually the people who make the mistakes. Gartner had this great quote. They're like, hey, through 2020, 95% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. S3 buckets, Verizon, everybody, <laughs> their brother, Right, And I saw this quote, and uh, at the time I was reading this book, and I'm going to put, uh, at the end of this talk, I'll put up some references if you guys want to 
take up this, this point about design and learn about it further. Um, but I was reading this book called Design of Everyday Things. And I'm reading this book, and it says, 95% of industrial mistakes are people's failure. I'm like, yes, same thing. And they're like, why is everyone so incompetent? I'm like, yes, tell me why everyone is so incompetent. I need to know. I can make a talk of this. And I flipped the page, and the answer came up. And they're like, there aren't. It's a design problem. <laughs> Does InfoSec have a design problem? Is this our issue? Are we, are we creating situations where we don't have the, the guide rails to protect people that, that just make bad mistakes? Possibly, possibly. I mean, if you think about it just for a minute, cybersecurity is effectively where security meets mankind, right? It's where the people touch the keyboard. We know this. We know this. We talk about this all the time. Uh, there's talks here about things like end user awareness and phishing and everything else. Um, IC3 looked at it, uh, business email compromise, $1.2 billion lost last year for business email compromise. $1.2 billion, that's huge. Um, there's payroll division scams all the time, right? They log in and they divert payroll. There's invoice scams, they log in and they divert uh, invoicing. Why? Because that's where people touch the machine. We talk about it all the time with software development. You guys see some of the AppSec talks here? protecting the, uh, the Death Star and everything else. Kind of don't want to protect the Death Star, by the way, but if you are going to be responsible, I suppose you should. So when I was looking for a, a slide, I'm Googling like software development, I found this one, and those of you guys who are in the AppSec world probably recognize that right in the image of how we talk about code is a SQL injection flaw. We keep making these mistakes over and over again. People keep making these mistakes over and over again. IT people do it all the time. They rack and stack, but they don't patch. They rack and stack, but they don't change the passwords on routers and passwords on uh, switches. Uh, on Twitter last uh, week, it was passwords on cameras, which was a lot of fun. I actually was doing an assessment with a guy one time. It was a PCI assessment. And the whole thing was, can you get to the cash registers? And they had just put up all these cameras. So he's like, all right, do like James Bond stuff. I couldn't like, crawl under and everything. And he's gone for like five minutes, he comes back. I'm like, well, that was quick. He goes, yeah, I got good news and bad news. I'm like, oh, okay, what's, what's the good news? He goes, well, those cameras, they really do work, and you can't like James Bond your way around them. I'm like, that's good. Bad news? Oh, it's okay, they put them on the guest Wi-Fi, it's all clear text, it's default passwords, I just deleted all the video, so we're cool. <laughs> And then, of course, we got cloud. We got cloud. And, you know, as we talk about scope, and scope is our critical business applications. We are now super secret certified SOC 2, high trust, whatever, for this cloud application. It's like, fantastic. That's awesome. How many applications? Two. How many applications does a typical organization use? 928. <sighs> So we know that people are in the situation where mistakes are happening. And we know that uh, from the Verizon Data Breach Report, you know, according to their research, one in five breaches were due to mistakes. So I think we can safely say that if security happens where mankind meets uh, machine, we need to start looking at that interface a little bit closer. The old thing about communication was fantastic, right? You guys have heard the saw. Communication is not what we say, it's what they hear. I actually hate this because I say something that's really cool and clever, and people tweet it back, and I'm like, that's not what I said. What the hell? But it's something that we all struggle with, right? Did I say the right thing? Did I say it in a way that made sense when I'm communicating with my end users, my kids, uh, everybody else? But I'd say that InfoSec, the corollary is this. Security is not what we control, it's what they do. It's not the controls we put in place, it's not the technology we configure, it's not the check boxes we've checked off, it's what people actually do. And because of this, because of this, I've been spending a lot of time on design. Spending a lot of time thinking about this as a design problem. This is the first conference here, actually, uh, uh, Circle City Conference, the first conference that had me out to keynote on this idea. So my Twitter feed is down here. As I talk about this, if anything doesn't make sense, hit me up, ask me questions. If you guys have great ideas or have some successes, before this talk, I was having some conversations about uh, LastPass and how that was sold as a way to, where's the guy I was talking to? Is he in here? Yeah, okay. Um, so as it was sold as a way to uh, increase productivity, and of course it's made people faster, but also made them more secure, those types of things, hit me up on Twitter and let me know. I'm really looking at this space very, very closely this year. But anyway, so InfoSec has a design problem, right? So now what? <laughs> what do we do from there? Where do we go? 
I want to talk about this in three different ways. I want to talk about uh, usability, manageability, and defensibility, making it easier for the folks who are on the front lines and the folks who are controlling things, and of course, making it really hard for our adversaries. Uh, usability, usability. So we think about controls, and we put controls in place, and they're awesome. And sometimes we don't need to worry about that because we're not the ones who have to follow the controls, right? Security people are special. We know what we're doing. We're secure. We don't need to follow all that crud. But it's the users. We really need to protect the users, right? I found myself in a user situation. I want to tell you this story because it drove me nuts. Um, I was doing this audit. I was doing this audit, and I was helping this organization get ready for um, their, their upcoming internal audit. And they're like, OK, this is great. We're going to secure 2FA. I'm like, I love 2FA. They're like, here's a token. Shoot. I lose everything, guys. I mean, everything. I, I bought a house a year ago. I know a year ago because my Facebook reminded us, right? It's a house anniversary. It's fantastic. And it's haunted. I'm telling you, I've got my coffee. I've got my keyboard. I set down my coffee, and my keyboard's gone. There is a poltergeist in that place that steals all my stuff. So you better believe. And someone was, before was talking to me and saying, oh, you should get tiles. She's got me tiles. I've lost the tiles. <laughs> so I'm already in a bad spot with this RSA token. Next, they give us this uh, VPN software that is the most outdated VPN software I've ever tried to use. I installed my box. It breaks VPNs to other clients. Um, but what was really bad about this VPN software is because it was outdated, it didn't quite do um, you know two-factor well. You had to log in with your username and password. Awesome. Then you had to log in with your username and the first characters of your password and the token number. That didn't make sense to me. You're hashing my password, but you have it in the four characters? Okay, fine. And then, then sometimes a third time would pop up and say, up oh, incorrect password, and you'd have to just enter in the token number alone. Sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes it did that because I put in the wrong four characters of the password and had to redo this process. It was a pain in the butt, pain in the butt. And then once you did all that, we had a shared account. I don't know why we had a shared account. We had a shared account where we net used onto the server to get to the folder where we were sharing all these files. You wouldn't use uh, a SIFS SMB over a VPN over hotel Wi-Fi at a conference recently? <laughs> wow. And this was the environment, now, multi-factor authentication, not to mention the fact that they were moving the evidence and changing files, and they were like, oh, you used the wrong version, because there's no version control, it was a mess. This was the experience that we were faced with trying to audit this company. And I think therein lies the start of this conversation. All the security controls are here, right? All the things that we tell people to do are here, in a way. But what we need to start doing is thinking about it more like an experience, thinking about it more like a workflow, thinking about how people are actually going to use this stuff. And it starts with tool use. Tool use theory is really freaking fantastic. Um, you guys all know the Sonic screwdriver, right? Yeah, I mean, he's got it. He just does the thing. He's like, and you hear the sound, and he's like, that's fantastic. You know he's going to solve it, and the door pops open. Or the robot, see, the robot moves. Glitch, you are fantastic. I love you. Um, <laughs> so the sonic screwdriver, right, is, is the multi-purpose tool of Doctor Who. What's important about this, and what I want you to take away from this, is this. One, the doctor never has to think about what he's trying to do. He points the tool, and something happens, right? It's not a matter of spending a whole bunch of time on figuring out how that tool works. Two, he gets the data he wants. He gets the information back. He gets the action he wants. And three, it progresses the story without slowing anything down. Why is this important? Because tool use, tool use theory states that the more you have to think about a tool, the less you're going to use it. When they look at craftsmen in the state of flow, that state of like intense concentration, when they look at craftsmen in the state of flow and they actually look at tool use, you know what they find? It's fantastic. The division between the tool and the person disappears. You no longer think about it as being a tool. It's an extension of yourself. You go to take the action, the action happens. Tool use theory. When you don't do that, when you create this whole gamut of controls, um, what happens? Well, the street's going to find its own use for those tools, right? We're going to do our own damn thing. We're not going to sit there and take that. We're a bunch of hackers. We're not going to just muddle through with the wrong tool. And because of that, when you tie in tool use theory to creative constraints, creative constraints is the idea that the more constraints exist, the more creative people get. Creative constraints 
is a fantastic explanation for every conversation I've ever had at Circle City Con around some bourbon, usually at the cigar joint down the corner, where people are like, do you know what my users did? I'm like, what did they do? They went and bypassed and made copies and backed up and moved around. And then they, I'm like, they did what? Yeah, and then they used their own credit card to set up an application without checking with procurement. Like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I would have never seen that coming. <laughs> How many constraints did we put around them? The more constraints we add, the more likely people are to break security. All those steps earlier I mentioned, by the way, uh, we actually caused a bit of a security incident because one of my guys went, Wolf's never going to remember that RSA token. And he was very helpful, and he copied all the data out onto our SharePoint, um, inadvertently violating the agreement we had with the company not to take any data off-site. But they didn't think about that, right? Because you create situations with constraints that make people creative. It's very interesting. So we can look at design theory to kind of figure out how to design things in, in a way to reduce constraints and reduce those risks. Um, things like contrast and proportion, proximity and pattern, unity and alignment, movement. These are the, the fundamental principles of design. These are found in everything from the building we're sitting in, to the chairs that we're sitting on, to this council, to everything that we look at in the city as we walked around it the past couple days. Design theory, these are the fundamentals. It's really quite fascinating if you apply these concepts to cybersecurity. I'm going to dig into a couple of them and then we'll move on. Um, pattern. Pattern is the, the pattern interaction that leads to repetition. It's, all right, if these are the six steps I take, if I'm always taking the same six steps and I get the same behavior, it becomes second nature. It becomes like that tool use. It becomes embedded in my consciousness. Uh, you guys have probably heard me say when work looks like work, work gets done. I talked a lot about this when I was doing security exercises. How do I get uh, people to run red team exercises for me when it's IT? I make it look like IT work. How do I get people to do patching? I make it look like the regular work that they're going to do every single day. How do I get users to go ahead and do security things? I make it look like part of the work that they do, right? It's a known, simple pattern. When it work does not look like work, that's when you get resistance. You get delays. Um, that's when people go, oh, I didn't have time for that. I'm sorry, I didn't do my audit for six months. When work is something unusual to them, they push it off. So that pattern is very important. Movement is the next one. Movement is the concept of however something is designed, it gives you an impression, an idea of how it's supposed to move. Um, if you guys were in Indy uh, the other day, I think it was Thursday, there's this great door that had this awesome hinge, and I walked up to the hinge, or I'm sorry, awesome like door handle, I walked up to the door handle to pull it open, and I'm pulling, and I'm pulling, and I'm pulling. I'm like, Ugh! And then I'm watching other people push their way in the door. I'm like, da, 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 da. totally got this. It was a bad design. I'm arguing it's a bad design, not that I'm an idiot. <laughs> because the design, the door looked like you should pull it. There was a handle to pull, right? When you create these situations that and people can infer what to do, they're going to do those things. So by studying and sitting down with the users and see what they do naturally, we can figure out what their movements are and put IT in place with that. I'll give you the counterpoint. Uh, several months after that token of a mess, I was doing with another customer, also doing internal audit for them, and they said, we don't want you to have any of our files. I'm like, okay, we'll do it that way. Just gonna add a couple weeks on. They're like, all right, so here's, here's the email to do what you need to do. I'm like, all right, an email. And it's like, download box. I'm like, I like box. It doesn't break any of my software. And oh, by the way, we got a very simple push uh, to a that you need to use. Everyone's got their own user account. And then they did the most fantastic thing. For anyone who's ever had to do audits, they had version control on. Win! Same controls, right? Same bloody controls. Was any of my team tempted to copy files out of this? No. It was easier. It was bloody simple, easy. Another example of this, which I think is even better, speaks to application development. Um, I was doing research on securing without slowing. So DevOps teams that had security injected in them that were able to go faster. Surprisingly, there's a few of those. Very few. I, I would have thought more. No. <laughs> I found one. This company or this team was working uh, with FedRAMP. Anyone do FedRAMP? Yeah, I'm sorry. So you guys know, for the rest of you guys who don't, uh, whenever you do a FedRAMP project, you triple the amount of time you think it's going to take and you double the budget. And then maybe you'll get it done in time. It's a ton of NIST controls, a ton of things you need to do with continuous monitoring and everything. Great stuff. Great stuff. Love it. 
Glad the federal government is doing it. Very, very hard to do. So this team was checking in applications, and they're like, you didn't do Kanman. I'm like, okay, fine, go back. Oh, yeah, but you didn't do release management. Okay, fine, go back. And they kept doing this cycle, and it would take um, the government anywhere from 24 to th or from 12 to 36 months to push out applications. Like, this is not sustainable. This is crazy. So this team took their best people off, for a quarter, took their best people off, and went and found the patterns and practices of all these apps that made them compliant and made them successful, put it together in one app package that you could download and build your, your package on. Think of like WordPress if you want to build a blog, but this was like FedRAMP starter kit. Everything you needed. And now organizations could pull this down, build their app, and get their app up and running and approved in under six months. Freaking huge. Pattern and movement, package they could use, the developers were able to start with a secure space and go. So when we think about it, the idea here is, when we talk about usability, it's reducing the friction, reducing the effort. Think of all the steps that people have to do to be successful to do the work, minimize those steps, and make those steps look as much as possible like things they're used to. They could look as much as possible like tool use so they can just go ahead and get them done. Really simple stuff. I'm gonna take a sip of my coffee real quick. All right, let's talk a bit about defensibility. Now that we made it nice for the users, let's make it terrible for the bad guys. Ah, uh, WePro. You guys hear about WePro? It's my favorite hack of the month. <laughs> There's always one, right? I can't, when, there, when like uh, Home Depot happened, I was so happy because I was sick of talking about Target. I'm like, yes, there's another one. All right, <laughs> it's terrible, it's terrible. So WePro happens, and there's two stories. There's two stories. WePro says, advanced, sophisticated attacker in an O-Day. Krebs says, phishing email. In between those two, there's the reality. I'll let you guys decide. But what was interesting is WePro does all the IT administration for a bunch of different major organizations. And because they're attacked, now we've got to worry about are our administrators really our administrators or are our administrators a malicious actor using those credentials? Very difficult to tell if you're a WePro customer. There's evidence that second stage attacks were set up to go after several organizations. I'm going to pull out four and talk about them really briefly. But the idea was they set up some um, URLs and different things so they could take those WePro creds and jump into those organizations and ex execute secondary attacks. These are some of them. Sears surprised me. I'm like, wow, Sears is still around. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I was thinking like a wish book catalog. I'm like, do you guys still do that? I want the book. I want to circle what I want for Christmas and then lose it. Um, <laughs> Elevon was arguably, to me, the scariest ones. Uh, when I did my research on Apple Pay and tokenization, I speculated that the next big breach, once we get people onto tokens, once we get people on secure credit cards, once we start hardening down point-of-sale systems, which unfortunately we haven't all done yet, uh, the next big breach, if you want to capture like a bazillion credit cards, is going to be one of these credit card processors. And that's what Elevon is. If you are running your card, look at the logo. If an Elevon pops up when it's processing, they're doing the processing in the back end. They're responsible for about a third of all processing across North America. Rackspace, private cloud. Wouldn't that be great if you get into Rackspace and then you could attack Rackspace customers? Awesome. Capgemini Consulting, imagine all the stuff that they have. So I'm sure their people never copy stuff off of people's companies. So we've got this situation where a major attack is ongoing. You can read Krebs for the background and whatnot, and these uh, companies are stacked and ready to be attacked, right? I'm going to pause this for a minute and talk a little bit about why this happened in defensibility. The problem with um, companies like uh, WePro, or really any company, is if you are an IT service provider, you are... Uh, set up to do the same. I want to do the same for you. I want to do the same for you. I want to do the same for you. Same for you. Same for you. So I can train my people, right? Standardization is key. What that leads to is monoculture. If everyone's running the same stuff, the same type of attack that works on you will work you, 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 all over the place. We see this all the time with vulnerabilities. WannaCry went everywhere because of the monoculture that existed that allowed it to spread. So design patterns are really, really powerful when we're talking about usability. It runs us into problems when now, if there's a vulnerability in that uh, web package and it's across 50 apps, now we have got 50 apps we need to worry about. So 
back to WePro. WePro gets popped, Krebs reports it, these four companies and a bunch of others are, are open, and then what happens? Crickets, basically. There's some gift card fraud. I don't want to. I don't want to downplay it. Some gift card fraud, but we haven't really heard much of anything else at the moment. And I think that's kind of interesting because we hear something like that. We're like, ooh, they're going to do all sorts of crazy stuff. They're going to steal bazillion credit cards and send us all bad wish books. Um, <laughs> but then they don't, and you're like, what happened? What, what went wrong there? And part of it, I think, is we tend to think of all criminals and bad guys as being the same, having the same uh, characteristics, same operas mundi, the same desire to wreak havoc, and really there's several different kinds, right? Um, we've got our Daleks, the sophisticated attacker, exterminate, exterminate, right? Running around, wreaking havoc, and you want to be hit by a Dalek. You do not want to be like, uh, boss, we, we got hacked. Really, really, what happened? Well, um, it was this Victorian gentleman, and he was trying to maximize his money. What? Villain of the month? That's what we got hacked by? No, no one wants to be in that IR scene, right? We want the press release that said the Daleks came, and they used an O-Day, and they exterminated our WAF. <sighs> so we got the Daleks. We got the Cybermen, which I will, for the sake of this talk, be referring to as your automated attack. Cybermen are the, the wanna cries of the world. Uh, Cybermen are the ones that are automated and relying on monoculture to spread very quickly. Cybermen, if there is a uh, worm off the RDP vulnerability, are the ones that are scanning port 3389 and spreading like wildfire and converting the world into their Cybermen uh, state. And then we got the Weeping Angels. Kind of scary. Anonymous. You know? They want to steal your time. They want to waste your time a little bit. Uh, but, but, Arguably, curious activists, not necessarily as bad as these guys. I posted this on Twitter, and I was having a, uh, some fun with it, and someone was like, and don't forget the Slitheen. I'm like, yes, the ultimate insider threat. And everyone who's Doctor Who laughs, and everyone else is like, what? So, when you go back, Alex Rogan is the one who said this on Twitter, so props to him. If you go back, and you're having a conversation, someone says Doctor Who, and you go, yeah, Slitheen, I'm protecting against insider threat like them. And they just walk away. <laughs> Let it go. All right. So what, what does this have to do with criminal hacking? Well, I, I mentioned in usability that creative constraints are a thing, that we want to think of the workflow of the attacker or of the, the user, and we want to simplify it and condense it. Um, it's the exact opposite for the criminal. We want to drag it out. We want to make it unusual. We want to make it so that their tools, right, tool theory, where I don't have to think about it, I just have to point it and go. We want to make it so their tools don't work. Changing ports, changing drive letters, those sort of things. Anyone who's ever done threat modeling and done an analysis goes, oh, look, there's like 10 steps that the attacker would have to take. And I've got prevention detection in all 10 steps. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. And I've got a way to see it in my log. Awesome. And then that person, kind of like a light bulb clicks on, they're like, wait a minute. Why in cybersecurity do we always say that uh, the bad guys only have to be right once? We've got to be right every single time, but the bad guys, those Daleks, don't need to be right once. Oh, hell no. They need a lot of Daleks to get in, right? They need to be right every single one of those steps of the attack path. And the more steps, you can kind of have an intuition that the more steps um, that it takes, the harder it is to break in. Now, you may wonder how many steps is the right number of steps, and I've always wondered that. I've never had seen any good data. Until this year, Verizon Data Breach Report published this brilliant chart. I love this chart. It's a beautiful chart. Uh, success on one axis, number of steps on the other axis. By the time you get to five steps, most attackers are done. 15 steps, completely zero chance of success. 15 steps. If we can think of 15 steps that we put an attacker through, they're not going to get us. And most of the Cybermen, if it's like one or two steps and they, their tools don't work and everything, boom, done. They're moving on. Weeping Angels, if you're running at a different spot and they can't get you, all right, they're going to be like, ah, no, I'm a hacktivist and I just want to break as many sites as possible. You're confusing me. I'm moving on. It's really, really that simple. So we can use human-centered design to make inhumane nightmares for the red team criminals, attackers. There's actually um, a subset of architecture called um, hostile architecture that focuses on this. You guys may have noticed it outside the, the building. 
Uh, there is a lovely brick wall with kind of like an uneven top. Did you guys see this? That's an example of that. The whole design is so that people won't sit there for very long and definitely won't lay down. There's ways to do architecture so that you guide people to do certain activities um, without having to put up big signs saying, stay out, keep out, and putting on a whole bunch of defenses and fences and everything around. That type of mentality, that hostile um, architecture, I think is fantastic for applying to cybersecurity. So you take about those steps, you think about how to make them as hostile as possible, and then you start changing things to mess with them. Now people may go, that's eh, security through obscurity, right? Because you've changed your port number. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll kind of take that. But it's security through obscurity if that's the only thing you've done. If you've done it across multiple steps, it works pretty damn well. I used to run all my Citrix servers on the M drive. That was the old pattern practice back in the day, if you guys remember. And everyone used to write their malware, all the, all the malware authors were hard coding the C drive, and so the malware would run and it would die. It was awesome. I'm like, I've got the best malware defenses ever. Which was good because I was running like CA as my antivirus, which was not the best ever. Um, so, um, examples of this. One, this is a really old example, but it just cracks me up. And it gives me a chance to give a shout out to my local security community, MySec. Uh, MySec, back in the day, back when we kept it real, and it was Backtrack, not Cali, all you youngins. Back when it was Backtrack. Um, Backtrack would uh, load with a default password and username, right? It was root and tor, as you guys may remember. And so uh, a local community member, what she did was, across the campus, she wrote a rule that would look for the signature of Backtrack on the device. Um, so if anyone booted up uh, on her network, Backtrack, she would see it on the network, and she would run a script that would SSH, end his root and tor, and shut it down. <laughs> it was awesome. Because they would send in pen testers, like, oh, this is an easy environment. We're just going to send our script kitty pen testers. And they'd spend three days going, why does my backtrack not work? And it, you can still find some like user forums are like, has anyone seen backtrack like shutting off like two minutes after it logs on? This is really weird. Awesome stuff. Not possible today, but as an example, what you might do. Uh, another example that we recently ran into, and this gets to the question of, well, wait a minute, Wolf, you're saying make it easy for users, transparent for users, make them not to think about it, but at the same time you're saying make it harder for attackers, make it impossible for them to get around. Isn't there a conflict there? Isn't there a conflict there? Because if we're adding steps and removing steps, somehow we gotta jive those two things. One way to jive those two things is with thresholds. So about uh, two years ago now, we're doing this pen test, and uh, we're, we're you know running a, a spider on the web app, and of course, that creates a whole bunch of page uh, errors 404, right? Page not found. And then we found a couple of SQL injection flaws, and uh, we were trying that out. So of course, that was generating and throwing up uh, HTTP 500s. What happened was, we would be able to run for like a minute, and then like 15 minutes, we couldn't do anything. And then we'd run for a minute, and then 15 minutes, we couldn't do anything. Like, man, this feels like backtrack all over again. Um, and so what happened is this organization had Nginx, and they had set up uh, thresholds. So if you got so many 404s or so many 500s, they would deny access for 15 minutes. Bloody brilliant. If you're a user and you're getting a whole bunch of 404s, that is weird behavior. People should not do that. That is very strange. And if you are and suddenly you can't log in, you go watch an episode of Doctor Who, have some tea, come back, and now you can get in and everything's fine. Awesome. It doesn't really add that much of uh, inconvenience to users. So this thresholding concept I think is a great way to add extra steps. You can see this in this very simple example. You can also see it in examples of folks who uh, threshold how many actions happen on an application, how many times you log in, how many different logins you can have from an IP address. Thresholds where you can look across your environment using Splunk or something, see what's normal, and one order of magnitude above normal, put an alert to stop. So when it happens, you know the criminals are blocked and you can take action. That's a way of designing for defensibility, increasing friction, increasing effort, making things more difficult for the attackers. Let's talk about manageability for a minute. And our lovely TARDIS console. I freaking love it. All the lights, all the buttons, the screen. There's probably a pew pew map in there. Pretty close to a pew pew map. I think. All right. So. <laughs> When I talk about security, and I've talked about this for a long time, I'm kind of anti-castle, 
right? I don't believe security is about castle building and high walls and strong doors. I missed um, Allie's talk earlier today, so I'm going to catch that and she may change my mind. But if you look at castles, they tend to take about 25 years to build during the classic period. They tend to take about 17% of the revenue of an organization. So think about yourself as a security manager, security director, a CISO. Uh, would that work? Can we go to our CFO and go, hey, look, I need 25 years and 17% revenue. I'm going to secure everything. They're going to give us that? No. No, we usually get maybe 25 days if we're lucky. <laughs> and 0.00000% of the budget. So my, my way of always thinking about security for a long, long time is bells. I want bells that ring as the Cybermen stumble into my defenses so I know what step they are on that path between 1 and 15 so I can stop them, catch them, and do stuff to them, right? Trip them over, whatever it may be. Um, I want bells that make alarms. But what that means is back in the day when I ran uh, security operations for financial services, I had a lot of bells. And I used to do um, lunch and learns where we'd take controls and we talk about it. So we were looking at security controls several years ago, and we did a, a lunch and learn, we did a threat model, and we're like, oh yeah, insider threat, right? The Slitheen, what are we gonna do to stop the Slitheen? And one of the controls in there is to prevent people from logging to disabled accounts. I'm like, that's awesome, we'll create that in. And we built the rule, and we built the logging, we built it in Curator. Um, important point, I'm gonna talk about Curator twice, I'm not pitching any products, this is just what we use. So we built this rule in Curator, and this was a four-day weekend. I built it on a Thursday. We had the lunch. It was done by the end of the day. And I uh, went home and, you know, was back in the office on Tuesday. Opened up the console, and there's a million alerts. A million alerts. I'm like, what is going on? And so I reached out to my team. And uh, I'm like, what are you doing? Look at all these alerts. And they're like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah? Yeah, we just figured it was Wolf doing what Wolf does. Wolf doing what Wolf does? This is a threat. Get on it. And, uh, and it actually was, we had fired someone on Friday, and they spent the entire weekend trying to break in. And they're like, oh, it's just Wolf doing what Wolf does. And I told this story so many times over the years. This is like 10 years ago now. I was like, this is an example of why security operations centers are. And uh, I was telling this to the uh, uh, local uh, ISA chapter, and one of the guys raised his hand in the back. I'm like, yeah, what's up? And he goes, yeah, so what have you been doing about alert fatigue? I'm like, you can't make it my fault, man. <laughs> this was their fault. But it's so true, right? We don't think about when we're, when we're a CISO or security manager. That's someone else's job. They run those consoles. We don't necessarily think about that. Uh, and it can create a lot of complexity. And it goes right back to the TARDIS. The TARDIS is a fantastic machine. It's a fantastic part of Doctor Who lore. And it's also hilarious. Because the doctor doesn't know how to drive it. The first few seasons, he couldn't even control the thing, right? Um, there was, uh, there was a, a chance where the doctor was able to like get the manual. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll read that later. And doesn't even read the manual. Doesn't even know what he's doing. Um, his wife at one point in time is teasing him for leaving the parking brake on. Why did I left the parking brake on? We don't know. I mean, it's again and again this problem. But at the same time, the TARDIS needs like six people to ride and he's only one guy. So kind of we should cut him some slack. He's also brilliant and it always works out in the end. Isn't that kind of a really good analogy for a sock? I know sock guys would be like, wait a minute, he's doing the job of six people? That's a vacation. Sign me up for that, bro. Um, you know, I know times where the sock is absolutely understaffed, underpowered, undertrained, and getting by on wit, determination, and luck. And by God, if it's not a good 50-minute episode at that point in time, I don't know what is. The sock is very much like the TARDIS. And we need to think about... Um, human-centered design, this idea of being empathetic and being kind, this idea of looking at psychology and technology from the lens of the people who are running our tools. Because we ask a lot of them. There's this mythical single pane of glass. Every CISO says this, we want a single pane of glass. That sounds so awesome. I was talking to uh, an organization who was, uh, says they investigate phishing emails. I'm like, this is great. How do you do it? They're like, oh, it's, it's fantastic. It comes in one of a few ways. I'm like, well, tell me. I'm like, well, it could come in because they reported it and clicked on a button. Okay, that's one console. Or, oh, wait, it comes over here and I can see it through my capture. Oh, and also sometimes it comes in because we don't see it through the, the spam filter. No one reports it, but one of our guys notices something bad going on. I'm like, all right, show me those consoles. No, all you do. Now we create a ticket. All right, 
jump me into the ticket. So we pop the stuff in the, in the ticket. All right, now what do you do? Now we got to go onto the web and put the MD5 hash into VirusTotal and see what's going on. I'm like, awesome. Is it good? Is it bad? They're like, I don't know yet, because we have to check the IP addresses. Where do we do that? We do that on a threat intel feed. Awesome. Put that in threat intel feed. That's tell us. Okay, we're going to do this. And I'm like, duh, 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 duh. I'm like, oh my God. And I, and they walked through the whole process, and it was like a half hour. And I'm like, and how many do you get a day? They're like 200. <laughs> like, you investigate all emails 200? I'm like, well, we use a risk based approach. Okay. Single pane of glass. It's horrible. So if you think back about these ideas, con contrast, proportion, proximity, movement, let's take out a couple and see what we could do. One is alignment. So oftentimes when we're asking a, a security operations folks or people managing our security tech to do something, we haven't really thought about how we align all those tools across that process. If we think about how we align all those tools across that process, we can squeeze out a lot of extra uh, effort and we can make it much more easy for them to actually achieve things. So that's where alignment comes into place. It's good run books, right? It's good run books. Um, unity is the way to bring the elements together. And what I'm thinking about with unity is APIs. A lot of the tools today have great APIs. If you could bring the APIs together and you could unify how you use it, either through Bash or PowerShell, to bring together one idea and one view, you might have the ability to greatly reduce the amount of time it takes for people to do their jobs. And this is important because of a concept called the double diamond model. And this is really where every single security professional ever lives. You start off going, I have no idea what's going on. Is it a Dalek? Is it a Cyberman? Is it the villain of the week? I don't know. And you diverge as you investigate all these paths. And then you converge and go, yep, definitely a Dalek. Let's hope it's a Dalek. Let's not hope it's a Dalek. Uh, let's say it's Cyberman. Definitely a Cyberman. Now we need to clean it up. And then you diverge and you try all these different things, different councils to converge on the solution. Diverge on the problem, converge. Diverge on the solution, converge. If you look at Verizon and other reports, oftentimes this part of the response is months, that part of the response is months. Months, months and months and months we're doing it. And every time we're doing this, we're jumping up and down the panels and having ideas of what it is and what it isn't. When I do tabletops, oftentimes I'll like do two attacks at once, like a wanna an insider threat, just to see if people can figure out what it is. And everyone wants to be a Dalek. They all want it to be a Dalek, right? But it's so easy to be distracted and think it's something it's not and have to backtrack and redo your steps. So um, this gets to the idea of the CISO as the artist for their security team, right? The, uh, the artist formerly known as the CISO, <laughs> if you will. What, what makes a CISO an artist? One, you're, you're thinking ideas of subtraction, not only addition. Every time you're adding something, you're taking something away. Maintaining a portfolio of here's the actions my team uses, top 10 things they do. I need to add something to that. Well, what can I get rid of? What's no longer working? What's no longer needed? How can I manage that less? Here's the top 10 tools they're using. I'm adding a tool. Okay, what does that tool replace? What does that tool take the, the process of? And managing that as a portfolio where you're trying to manage down the total number of tools and effort and steps that people need. Um, Preparation over prevention detection. I love prevention detection. Windshore 2 and time-based security. I gotta give them a shout out just about every time I talk because it's such a great idea. Get the prevention time down, get the detection time down, have one step for every one of the 15. Awesome, 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 awesome. And CISOs have gotten this message and CISOs will say, don't talk to me about your product unless you can tell me how it prevents and detects. I'm like, yeah, great point. I'm like, let's talk about preparation. They're like, wait, no, bro, just prevention detection. That's what we're supposed to, no, what about preparation? So rarely do people spend time actually preparing, running through the tools, managing that pipeline, um, doing practice sessions, all those sort of things. Right? We need to start shifting it to the prep stage to really help and create a more usable and friendly environment for our folks. So I'll give you an example of an org that I think does it right. Again, this is IBM Curator, and again, I'm not pimping them. <laughs> it's just what they're running. Um, but it's a friend of mine. He lives in Michigan. Northern Michigan, it's a manufacturing organization worldwide. They got this beautiful sock. Beautiful sock, raised floor, all the lights, all the cameras. It's fantastic. They got multiple teams and they actually do preparation. They will do um, red team exercises twice a year. They'll do security uh, drills and tabletops quarterly. And they've got the multiple teams with their specialties. It's fantastic. Not a single pew pew map in the entire place. Not one. I know. You're like, what? What? A sock? How are you supposed to show an executive team that you're doing stuff? I know. I know. It blew my mind too. 
blew my mind too. They've got a, a panel that is basically check engine lights. And they've created their own scripts and their own consoles that will only light up if there's something going on. Again, based on thresholds, based on common use cases. And whenever they want to add something to that, they automatically look at what they're replacing. So bloody hell simple. And they're able to, with a, a pretty streamlined team, I think it's six to one, but it's a pretty streamlined team, do a lot of really creative, really awesome work without having to worry about all the tools and tool sets and do I have a manual and is my TARDIS doing its own thing, right? The clocks and bell rings and they jump into action because they see those things and then they can drill into the tools and the consoles. Really cool idea, I think. So with that, in conclusion to Wibbly Wobbly in designing security systems that are bigger than the inside. One, remember, please, it is bigger than the inside. Try not to limit scope. I know it's tempting. I know it's so tempting. Um, but most of the apps are in the cloud now. Most of your users are spending most of their time on uh, phones. Many of those phones are BYOD. Many of the people in your workforce are no longer employees. They're contractors, partners, and vendors. It's so much bigger than what we have to design. And what that means is, as, as a, someone who's a CISO or a director or a manager, as someone in this room who's going to be putting in a security system next week, you know who you are. You've got to think about it in terms of culture, and you've got to think about it in terms of guide rails, and you've got to think about it in terms of what is it that we're adding to the experience of the user, and how are we messing with the bad guys. Bring it together with three different levels. The usability. How many steps? Are we making users jump through? And when it's too many or too confusing or too unknown, they're going to get creative. And that creativity is what causes 95% of our security problems. Defensibility. How are we adding steps that trip up the bad guys? How are we messing with them? How are we putting in things that their scripts don't understand? So much of security today is actually software on software, right? The criminals write software and we write software and we let the software go head to head. It's like net wars or core wars back in the day. It's fantastic. It's fun. But what that means is all software has vulnerabilities. All developers have made assumptions. And if you can mess with those assumptions, you can break that cycle and you can break that software. And you can oftentimes thwart them well before you need an AV or well before you need to execute instant response. Which is good because manageability, our SOC people are already way overrun. They're overworked. We know this. There's not enough people in this industry. Uh, there's not enough time to get everything done. So we got to start designing using usability to make simpler, better ways for our folks to get their work accomplished. IT does not have to be mechanical. We all come up through um, the IT lens. Well, I shouldn't say we all, but most of us have, right? We're really good IT people. I oftentimes I ask CISOs, like, how did you get to be CISO? And they're like, well, I missed the meeting, and when everyone took a vote, they voted me on. <laughs> so I guess I'm in. <laughs> but uh, we, we started off as technologists. What's good security? It's a good firewall. It's good file system protection. It's good code, right? It's all the mechanics of IT, and it's beautiful, and the technology side is fantastic, and there's so many great talks and great ways to think about it that we just saw here this weekend at Circle City Con. But it doesn't have to be mechanical. It can be more than mechanical. It doesn't have to be utilitarian. We tell someone we need to have them log in, or use single sign-on, or use a password manager, or use multi-factor, right? It doesn't have to be this ugly thing that adds to their world. There are so many organizations out there that take time to sit down with the users and think, hey, how can we make your life a little bit better? How can we make that look a little bit easier? What is it your world looks like? Right? Getting outside that utilitarian, oh, I created a dialog box, it's great. Uh, see also every single cybersecurity council tool ever? You know, those ugly tools that we have to work with every single day? Uh, IT security can be creative. I think it can be creative. I think, and this is, this is my supposition that I'm playing with, and I'd love to hear you guys argue with me online or in a few minutes after this conference. I think it be, can be an art form. I think we can elevate the role of what we do every single day to being that of creating experiences for our users and creating really bad, devious experiences for the bad guys. It can be this marvelous, marvelous thing. We fundamentally design experiences, and I believe we must design better experiences if we're going to stay in control of the protection of our security. It's going to be way too easy at some point in time to go, oh, the new cloud security architect is now our cloud security officer. Wait, what about the CISO? Oh, yeah, he just does what's in the data center. As the data center gets smaller and smaller and smaller. All right? 
We've got to think bigger, think broader, and design better. I'm going to leave you with my, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Dr. Who from Capaldi. Uh, if you haven't seen the scene, by God, download the scene on, on YouTube and watch it. Um, always try to be nice and never fail to be kind. It sounds really kind of soft and squishy. But I argue if you think about tool theory, if you think about design theory, if you think about creative constraint theory, kindness is the ultimate security control. Because with kindness and thinking about how our users work and how they think, thinking about the people who operate the tools, what we're all going to do the next couple weeks back at our office, with kindness, we can create environments that can truly keep the bad guys out and keep our users safe. Thank you very much. Before I yield the stage to the end of the conference shenanigans, here are some resources. 99% um, Invisible is this really cool five-minute podcast uh, for design thinking. It uh, gives you like this really, I was listening to Cloud, or I'm sorry, Cloud. I was listening to Flag Design, and it gave me this great idea for cloud security. It's fantastic. So five minutes. Uh, Abstract is on Netflix. It's about an hour. They uh, feature a whole bunch of different folks, like the people who designed um, Dodge Chrysler cars, people design shoes, people design fonts. Really cool, it gives you all sorts of ideas there. Objectified is also on Netflix. The book I mentioned earlier is Design of Everyday Things. If you use these ideas in your office, if you want to talk about it, if you want to hop on a Skype session or tweet back and forth, please hit me up on Twitter. Again, my ID is down here. Um, and thank you very much.